Oh boy. You guys really want to jump into this rabbit hole, don't you? Alright, let's do this. Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Now, don't mind how I speak right now, I'm a bit sick from all the abyssiness, so yeah. You know, as much as I want to talk about the sinner's voice and who it might be, I was more scared of how over the top I could make this theory, considering we just met this thing and he's already getting cozy with our heads and hearts. Jeez, talk about racism, alright? But yes, welcome to another video of a guy who speaks to a rock! You're blowing everything we train for! Blowing it! It's okay, Rocky. You go when you feel like it. In this video, we'll be talking about the sinner. That's it. That's that's all we're gonna talk about. There is so many things that he could be, and there is so much things that he could be doing behind the scenes. Timestamps, of course, in the description and the comments. Let's go. So here's a little primer for the insanity that I've accumulated since 3.5 was released. The entity known as the voice in the head gives off this very ominous and sinister aura. Yet to beings with less knowledge of the world, as well as less mental fortitude, it is a calming aura that instantly makes you at peace. And that it gives off a sense of joy, or maybe even a sense of security, knowing that someone or something is watching over them and protecting them. Something I find interesting is that the sense of peace goes straight to the individual's heart or in short focuses on their emotions and feelings being at peace with the heart and peace of mind usually go in tandem and peace of heart can't really be achieved without first peace of mind because can you really have a peaceful heart when your mind is still busy with its endless conflicts your mind first needs to be lifted from the problems that you are thinking about and considering Clotar's situation with Carrie Bear and especially Conria he can't really be in peace of heart anytime soon but after seeing the shard right away his heart was at peace even though his mind was busy thinking about Carrie Bear what happened 500 years ago plus he got a mental debuff known as immortality and the erosion like side effects of being immortal has more than done enough to him. At that point, he's teetering between sanity and insanity. So in essence, he can't really be reasoned with. And we were lucky enough that we even struck a proper conversation with him in the first place. But the moment we got to the shard, he was at peace. He also felt the need to completely prostrate himself to the shard right away, and dare I say, completely nullifying the idea that the people of Conria don't worship any gods. An entity that can immediately take control of one's heart regardless of their state of mind and what ideals they stand for is borderline broken. He can basically control anyone with a big enough desire and use that desire to manipulate them almost completely. The voice's dialogue about fear of the unknown and coveted power not only applies to the power of fate and the abyss but also the power of desire and its potential. This is something that I didn't go over in my previous video since fate and abyss are pretty much dead giveaways to show how power Powerful he already is. But the ability to bend people's will by manipulating their hearts is not only a powerful, deceptive ability, but because you're using their own desire against them, they're more inclined to follow your orders because they've already given in to their own emotions, their feelings, their hearts. And because they gave in to their hearts, he is now free to manipulate those hearts. The sinner to me is a malevolent being that can appear anywhere at any time and easily interact with those that he deems worthy of his favor. Bear in mind, the sinner doesn't really need to be there physically unless it has to. Similar to the mysterious voice and Nahida in Golden Apple, something as powerful as the sinner can easily get into people's head through whatever they can without having to be nearby physically. He manifests himself to Clotar and our sibling, but I think he wanted to manifest himself to Clotar objectively. Our sibling being there may simply be fate and is now siding with the abyss order for that reason but i think that this was the perfect time for the sinner to target both our sibling and clotar simultaneously as well as needing to show himself physically if you believe that this is his physical form which i highly doubt having someone so desperate as to lose their kingdom having to deal with people whose obedience lies with the seven as well as an outlander who has fallen into a world that they bear in mind have zero ties with and is sent there by an unknown god they are more than just a angry with. Honestly, he couldn't ask for a better catalyst for spreading the abyss to everyone in Tavat. Now, appearing in Sumeru of all places can be explained by the speculation that Kanria is near Sumeru, as mentioned by Kaya. But if you think about it, the sinner can go to nearly any region he wishes. As someone who just disappears and appears in the domain of fate's end, he can basically carry that domain and pop into any location he chooses. Now, why don't we look into a few things that the sinner might have a hand in doing? 
It's hard to make sense of why he is a sinner and what his sin could be, as well as how the heck he hasn't been found out by the Seven or Celestia yet. But we do have other areas of the game that mention sins, as well as calming slash sinister auras. And even though these instances can be entirely other deities, the thought that it might have been the sinner is just really intriguing, but also really concerning to me. Abbas's journey finding his way through the dark cavern he escaped to could be one instance. Could be, okay? Now we already have assumptions that Abbas's god is King Deshret, but he never really says that it was King Deshret himself he was talking to, nor did he say that it was one of the seven or the sinner. It was mentioned that he could hear the voice of God and he etched whatever he heard, but it was implied in the notes of the doctor, likely the Tore, that Abbas hearing the voice of God was related to the resonant quakes in the dunes. Now, to my understanding, and this is one hell of a reach and pretty dumb reach at that, the only quakes in the desert are the ones paired with the sandstorms, which was the result of Erminsel being affected by the withering, and in turn the result of exposure to forbidden knowledge and Eleazar. But it was claimed by the doctor that his symptoms were completely removed. Whether or not this was Eleazar, I can't say, because Abbas still talks about Eleazar while he is escaping, as well as also exhibiting the mental instability that was present on previous specimens before him, leading me to think that maybe the physical effects of Eleazar were removed, but the mental effect of exposure to forbidden knowledge itself were still present. And what comes with forbidden knowledge and withering? That's right, the abyss. Abbas was awfully losing all hope for the gods as well. He was in despair and possibly a bit angry at his own situation, but he kept on searching for something to answer his empty prayers. A salvation of sorts or a miracle that can save him and forgive him for the sins that he and his people did. He later wrote that God forgives all after digging his way out of the cavern. Now it could be possible that this prayer was heard by the sinner too, since the sinner seems to target those in despair and anger as well as giving in to their emotions seeking a god or salvation. And considering the chasm is so close to Sumeru as well as the chasm being nearly the same location of Fate's End Domain, and there's also that hole speculated as Conria's entrance, not only that, the sinner has the power to see and hear everything. Even history and memories aren't an obstacle to him. So he can easily find Abbas in the desert, no problem. But that's only if it was the sinner that Abbas was hearing and not King Deshret or the Dendro Archon or his own thoughts. Since the abyss is so closely tied to forbid knowledge, I'm more convinced that Abbas was hearing the sinner mistaken as King Deshret the entire time, which is very terrifying, especially for anyone who thinks that they are hearing the voice of God. We all know that Tatarogami comes from the Orobashi, but the same can be said for any other god or deities that die. This is also apparent in the form of karma, a phantom wrath of slain gods that drives people insane, spawns lots of monsters, and creates plagues, as well as spreading pestilence. This same karma seeped into the Yaksha which drove them mad. Now, what if karma and Tatarogami, which are essentially dead god energy, all leak into Teyvat from one place? A place riddled with all the wrath and anger and everything everything that can corrupt the land of Tavad, a dark current of sorts that flows into the realm different from humans and elemental beings. Well, we already have one, aptly named the Void Realm, and it's where the abyss comes from. Like comes from, literally. The same abyss that corrupts and harms anyone in the light and human realm, as well as driving people insane. And maybe any being or god that falls or succumbs to an untimely demise all end up in this realm. This to me is the same corruptive force that ate away at the Yaksha and also corrupted quite a lot of people on Yashiori Island as well as Narukami Island. Remember what happened with the Kitsune Saigu and Mikushichio, the beast of sin and the dark will? That could be the sin. And if one dead god's corruptive force can corrupt a yaksha that is aware of the curse welling up inside them, a normal being can only think of it as mere hallucinations or a presence watching and hearing them, or maybe even gods speaking to them. Washizu's prayers and his hidden world quest is about the spirit dwelling inside the small temple next to him. He starts by stating things like words of the tongue are too loud and words of the heart are better, followed by mentioning a being simply called he. 
and him. Now, a lot of us already know that this is the remnant phenomena left by Orobashi, the Tatarigami. Many other quest items about Yashiori Island also state the same phenomena as the culprit, and is especially descriptive on Washizu's prayers, what with his own descriptions of his god being very snake-like, and that those who run into this god can't hide. But something I find weird is that Washizu, who isn't on the side of Watatsumi, calling them fools, even though Watatsumi basically worshipped the same deity. Finally, the distinct lack of elemental energy, which is pointed out by the Traveler. Now whether or not the Orobashi is an elemental being or a creature from the Abyss, we can't say. But of course, the lack of elemental energy is something to take note of. This is where the crazy starts, because Washizu is very adamant about the god. He hears and sees everything. He focuses on words from the heart. He requires constant worship, as well as desires being a main motivation for Washizu. The near zealous behavior is akin to what Klotar exhibits after coming into contact with the sinner, even so far as having sinned and asking that his sins be forgiven, and finally ending with us having to kill him for wanting a sacrifice and him wanting to be saved. At the end of the quest, we end up hearing a voice warning us of Washizu. To me, the entity interacting with Washizu is not the same as the one who warned us. The Tatarigami has also been affecting other people within Yashiori. Choji, the little kid with the ball, noticing a calm presence while he is in Yashiori Island, watching and protecting them. He says that it was the Raiden Shogun, but contrasts her oppression over the land to the calming and protective presence in Yashiori Island. One of the villagers, Shingo, also claimed to hear the word of God. A team that was sent to investigate the Tatarigami also mentioned the same symptoms. Next is this little handy notepad in Fort Mume mentioning another he along with a so-called unknown world, possibly pertaining to the fort itself. The most interesting character is Choji's mother, who to my understanding displayed so much anger after the death of his husband that it pleased the god that Washizu and Shingo worships. Washizu even references a kitsune demon, which I can only think of was the kitsune saigu escaping the dark will. This is something that neither Washizu nor Orobashi should know about, because that conversation is only between the dark will, which was the abyss's will, and the kitsune saigu, bargaining her memory to be left in Tavat while her body be taken by the will of the abyss. Orobashi and Washizu doesn't know about, nor has the Orobashi ever come anywhere close coming into contact with the Kitsune Saigu or Narukami Island. Finally, the quack pharmacist known as Yasumoto saying that the Tatarigami flows freely through her, which could be why he wants Choji's mother so much. Anger and despair are both characteristics displayed by Klotar and the abyss. Everyone in Yashiori displays the same signs of despair, anger, desire, and longing for salvation. Now, I know this is more than likely the Orobashi's curse manifesting in Yashiori, but what if there's another serpent? A serpent that is the manifestation of the death of all things, the embodiment of all Tatarigami. What if there's a serpent that manifests all forms of karma? What if the dark will, which is the amalgamation of all death, happened to be a serpent? It's crazy and dumb, I know, but this is where I think Genshin's plot is going. There's another character that also displayed these same characteristics which might have pleased him, and we can find her all the way to before the game was even released. Kali and her less than enjoyable story in the manga is about her trying to control her involuntarily obtained power. She was injected with a substance called Archon Reagent or Archon Residue, which is the remains of a fallen god made into a substance used by the Fatui. And she displays her use of this power pretty well, I must say. Barnabas calls this power obtained by Kali as favor of their god. Her power manifests in the form of a serpent, a serpent who calls himself a god and calling her a vessel. The serpent I can only assume is the god that Barnabas is talking about. Funnily enough, the chapter of which this all happens is called the Serpent's Dance. The serpent entity also whispers into Kali's head similar to all the other instances I've mentioned, droning on Kali and telling her what to do as well as telling her to give in to her emotions with a bit of revenge sprinkled in. Barnabas transforms into what I can only call the Beast of Sin, what with the lion-like body and the snake-like head, which could be a variation of the Beast of Sin. And since we're talking 
talking about the abyss, a beast of sin could be literally anything. The serpent inside Kali's head, Barnabas is God, the Tataragami in Inazuma, the Karma in Liwe, the Dark Will and the Beast of Sin in Narukami Island, as well as all the craziness that it caused, heck, even the Valens Abyss Rock that was stuck into his body, we can assume that this was from any old random fallen god, or maybe even a Sealy. But I'd like to think that this was something that has been in the game for a while now, one that we were told about every 40 days, endlessly. The same story over and over. Something that reveals themselves and favors anyone who expresses great amount of anger and despair, as well as longing and desire for salvation. Something that favors anyone who gives in to their emotions and those who desire and long for salvation. This god being a serpent isn't far fetched either, since we know another serpent that isn't Orobashi and has been busy corrupting a so called first heir. The Dark Serpent, or what I like to call Gnostic Serpent, is to me the most anticipated yet unknown characters within the game. Not only because it was only mentioned in the Gnostic Chorus, but because the place it originates from, the Kingdom of Darkness, is equally shrouded in mystery. We know about Conria and the Abyss as much as we know about Timmy and why he has a Ruin Guard. And every small nugget of info about them we try to put together, but for some reason there's still something missing. The sinner's identity could very well be anyone, but the only reason I think it's the serpent is because if you think about it, the deepest and oldest sin is what this serpent did before it even deceived the first heir, hence the kingdom of darkness as well as this serpent being present in the Gnostic Chorus. And whatever it did to become this thing, this he, this sinner, this harbinger of the abyss, is the one thing that is worthy of being called a sinner. And he himself proclaims it. He is not a god, he is but a sinner. And maybe this sin he did long ago is to spread corruption, pestilence, filth, insanity, beasts of sin. To spread the abyss is one and the same as spreading an incurable plague. And this plague brings forth illusions and breaks the shackles of the land. Illusions that only Celestia can cleanse. This sin that he has done is always being covered up by the gods. And those who unveil his sin are forced to be wiped out as a measure of fear that it might again spread. All the while he crawls into every crevice and seeps into every gap that it can to spread its malignant illness. But we know virtually nothing about this serpent or if he is even a serpent in physical form, since Venti's poems are ballads and allegories anyway. We only know that there are two heirs, a kingdom of the heavens, a kingdom of darkness, a genesis pearl, and this serpent that was never spoken about. In game, there are the twins. Celestia, the Archons, the Abyss and Conria, the Fatui, the Old World, and now the Sinner. So this Sinner to me is the so-called Serpent of the Abyss. He who committed the first sin of spreading the plague of the Abyss. But we don't know who he is. Again, and as many times as I can say, this is only speculation. But you guys might want to brace for the future because not only are we getting closer to Conria, we're also finding more and more about the possible origins and the events that led to the fiasco that is Genshin Impact. But I've taken too much time already and I think it's better if I let this first half of a vague speculation jog your mind as to who the sinner might be. The next video will be decided on a poll which will include the continuation of this video but will focus more on a single entity, the Serpent of the Abyss, and who it might be. This video is already too long for an outro, so do the like, do the comment, do the subscribe and the bell, and I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? As always, stay mad, theorists. Bye!